we're going to start with the next lecture. Uh, we're going to listen, please. We're going to listen to Hubert uh, Chilasse, is that right? Yep. And uh, he's going to talk about. Can you please say it? It's really loud. I don't really loud. I can hear you. Um, he's going to talk about agile in large enterprises. So um, thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, I'm an agile coach. I've been an agile delivery consultant mentor for many, many years. And what I want to talk to you about, about today is agile in organizations, particularly agile in large organizations. Uh, this talk is more about the how rather than the why. I think the why is pretty, pretty much common sense. So I'm going to focus more on the how today in the next half an hour. hour. So a couple of things, right? So seeding maturity, uh, agility, and maturing as a, in organizations is hard, you know, regardless of the size of the organizations. But doing so in large organizations is even harder. Uh, I've had the privilege of doing so for about seven, eight odd years. I can tell you it is hard work, but it is a lot of fun. So what I want to do is just share some of my journey with you guys uh, over the next half an hour, hour and share some of my wins and my learnings you know, as, as a scrum master from my earlier days or an agile coach and an agile delivery lead uh, to a peer, a colleague, a friend, son, sibling, as a human being, what have I kind of like learned? Um, so you might not say, What's the story, right? So the story is that as an agile practitioner, uh, I want to share some wins, lessons about pragmatically uh, facilitating agility in organizations and people and teams so that society gets us better at responding to complexity and change. Because for me, that is one of my big themes. It's, it's not just about agility in organizations, it's about agility in people, and people exist in and out of organizations. So if we can get good at responding to change and complexity at work, we become better at responding to change and complexity outside of work, outside of work. That is where <clears throat> that is where the true magic is going to happen in terms of what Azure has to contribute uh, to society and organizations at large. So uh, I want to share a couple of things with you. Uh, these are like I think values I've gained over the course of my experience. So I'm just going to stick to the valuable stuff. Uh, not a lot to share, but uh, let's start off. So my first and my biggest theme uh, over the years that I've developed is just be human. You know, and as a person, try and live. This is what I find. Try and live to these principles and these values. So as a person, I want parties to have open and transparent conversations that are respectful of people. Uh, they're focused on our learning, as opposed to my learning, on our learning, uh, so that I remain committed to my continuous improvement, because I want to learn from others and others want to learn from me. Does that resonate with you guys? Yeah? So, for me, this is the big thing. Right? And this is the theme that I've kind of carried forward, and this is the theme that I carry forward uh, when I go into organizations and start working with individuals and teams. So what, is, what does being human actually mean? Like, you know, how do we make it tangible? Uh, we make it tangible that's by being yourself and better. And by that, what I mean is a few things. Right? One of them is be open and transparent. Call it as you see it. You know, particularly in large organizations, there is a lot of, uh, maybe a lot is not the word, right word, but there is some level of fear in large organizations, particularly when they're going through a reorganization, right? And there is, you need to address that fear head on. Uh, what that means is, you'll find people sweeping stuff under the carpet. You know, don't care X, don't tell Y, I'm not going to do this quietly. But, as well as change agents, or agile practitioners, as scrum masters, or product owners, or members of a team, is to be open and transparent. I it's part of as you see it. You, know, you will break a few eggs in doing so. Uh, but keep 
people appreciate when you are respectful, when you're focused, and you're committed to everyone's development and your own. They could eventually see where you're coming from, where you're trying to get to. And that pattern will repeat itself. The more you're yourself, the more you're open and transparent and courageous, the more people around you will feed off that energy and they will be more open and transparent. They will have to. They will, they will tap into their inner courage as well. The other thing is invest. Yeah? Invest time in people. Invest in sharing your knowledge with them, so invest in them. And invest in yourself as well. Yeah? One, one of the big things is we get so busy at work that we stop self-development. So every now and then, take time out to keep yourself current with knowledge and things that are happening. Which means, yeah, attending camps, attending conferences more. I, said, I prefer more camps than conferences because we have more human connection in camps. And some of the things that make it to big conferences actually start from camps. So make the time to invest in tapping into and getting to know the community and network with the community. Build those relationships. Uh, remain committed. Whatever your focus is, just remain committed. Remain committed to your values. Yeah, which, which doesn't mean we don't compromise. We compromise on a daily basis. But we respect our principles and values. We don't compromise on them. We compromise on a whole lot of other stuff. And then be brave. Right? The hardest part is being brave. Uh, what I mean by that is have enough self-confidence and self-belief to know that if you call it as you see it and somebody decides to fire you, their loss not mine. I can walk into another gate in a couple of weeks' time, or a few weeks' time, right? So if you have that self-belief, again, it will emanate. Other people will have that self-belief as well. And you'll be more brave at trying to change the, the status quo without that fear of what happens to me. Well, I know what my value is, and someone's not going to value it, and learn from it, and allow others to do as we're trying to do, i.e. if you're going to permanently block me or threaten me by saying that if you do X, you'll be gone. Or what? I'm gone. Right? So that's what I mean by, by being great. So why is it important to be human? Yeah? It's simple. It's serving by being and doing. It's leading by example. Right? If we, if we just simply evangelize and we don't live the values, we don't live the principles, very little happens. Magic still happens, but very little magic happens. If you really want transformation and agility to see it in a team, you gotta become contagious. Right? That's the that's the only way I've done. And it's not easy. Uh, you will step on toes, you will break eggs, uh, people may try and burn bridges, but your job is to make sure you don't let them burn those bridges. Whenever they burn them, you rebuild them. That's what I mean by investing. Always invest time and respect and knowledge in other people and yourself. <coughs> I've got three more things I want to share with you guys. Uh, very quick nuggets. First is teaming. Right? So what, what do I mean by teaming? By teaming I mean just embracing a whole bunch of stuff. From diversity, diverse teams are some of the richest teams you can work with, to divergence. The divergence of thought amongst the team, divergence of direction, not purpose, but divergence of direction. Embrace divergence is good. When we challenge people and people challenge us, that's how we learn. That's how our ideas and our thoughts they they take shape and they start evolving and they start emerging. Uh, if we're all homogenous in our thought in a team, if we lack divergence and diversity. I've seen nothing worse for innovation and improvement than that mediocrity in some ways, where everyone just simply agrees and everyone is a clone of the person next to them. And, and yeah, some of those teams have been amazing to work with and then see that diversity come out in them. And some of those teams have been like, get me out of here, please. Um, and they respect, right? and where it's due, like to whom it's due, and when it's due. I see a lot of people would sing praises of teams and individuals 
that we were not at the fact, but later on. You know, just whenever you realize someone res deserves and has earned your respect, give it to them then and there and celebrate that and spread that word. So you start creating a different kind of culture. Connect with people around you who have shared purpose and then connect people to a shared purpose. Because having that sh shared purpose is the key. Yeah, building a really rock solid cool team. Yeah, and and by, the, by rock solid cool team, I mean where we're, where we're friends. Yeah, we're not BFS, we're not exchanging buckets, but we're friends, right? So we can say stuff to each other. And yeah, we can suck for a little while. And we're like, oh, man, she pissed me off. But we're still friends. Yeah, and there's nothing more powerful about a team when you can get to that stage where we're as open and frank with each other as we are with our friends outside of work. That's, that becomes really magical for a team. <coughs> encourage others. Yeah, if you encourage others, others will encourage you. Be kind. Yeah, don't shoot anyone's ideas down. Not to their face and not, certainly not behind their back. I mean, if you want to criticize an idea, cool, challenge that idea. But to the person it comes from, not there behind that back because that is not openness and transparency. That is the opposite of being brave or investing in people. Because by challenging someone's idea, we're actually investing in their idea because we're trying to become a part of their idea by taking their idea on a journey where they may, it may or may not go there, right? But the fact is you're trying to challenge it with the right reasons. And the reason always is value. What's the true value of this idea? Again, this list can go on and on, right? But the thing is just be human. Be yourself and then a bit better. Uh, about something like, be a pluralist. Pluralism or a pluralist person is who accepts that greater than one idea or principles or values can coexist in an ecosystem. That is something we're lacking out of society. You know, we're regressing away from pluralism. I think the 90s and early 2000s were really good times for pluralism, but that has been changed in the last decade. And we can see it all around us, the world over, right? So, again, be a pluralist. Try and encourage others to be so too. And be excellent to each other. Yeah, this is, this is one of my favorite pictures from one of my most favorite cities uh, in the world, Amsterdam. So this is from Arcade Hotel. Uh, it's not in the center, but somewhere, but their message resonates so much with me, day in, day out. So if you just be excellent to each other at work, outside of work, you won't be able to resist the, the temptation or the urge to be open and transparent and be respectful and always be focused on our learning. Because every conversation is an experience to learn, you know, if we want it to be. I mean, it could be about love island, but Maybe there's some learning in there as well. Uh, second thing I want to share with you guys is something very real. In all organizations, particularly large organizations, where it can, it can get toxic, yeah? And it can drive us as agile practitioners or agents of change or disruptors <coughs> or entrepreneurs or pirates or whatever you want to call ourselves or rebels, right? It can drive us nuts and actually drive us willingly out the door because this stuff we just can't stand because in my case, I can't relate much to this. Why? Because it is the exact opposite of all those values, right? So it's the exact opposite of openness and transparency. Uh, it's the exact opposite of respect. So don't stand for this stuff. <coughs> And whenever I see it, one of the questions I ask myself is, like, what the hell happened to shared purpose, principles, and values? Because when you get these people together, it's everything is shared. When they diverge, the little, the little camps that get created. But again, it's our job to challenge them. Not because we're capable, because we're capable of that, but because we're human beings, and that is what we should be doing, to be better at who we are. We need to challenge this stuff. And it will always exist. We won't be able to do away with it. But what we want it to be is we want it to be open and transparent. We want it to be around the shared purpose. Yeah, politics 
Christ is not for it is something that we will always do as preachers. But it doesn't need to be toxic or dirty. It can be around the shared purpose. So how do we make that happen? How do we make <clears throat> that tangible? How do we challenge bad politics? So one is see a one team mindset. So when people have conversations uh, that exclude an individual, always include them and encourage the other person to have that conversation to their face. Yeah, what's going to happen is they will re-express their feelings and their emotions so as to be respectful to that other person. And when they do so behind their back, what do you guys think? Are we going to be always respectful? No, it's not. So encourage them to have that conversation. Okay. Hey, you have an issue with that person? Let's have a sit down. Let's have an open, transparent conversation. Facilitate. You know, don't just let them have a go at each other. Just try and guide that conversation and mediate that conversation so it's constructive and it's toward that shared pur purpose and it focuses on that issue that these two individuals or groups are having with each other. Uh, explore incentives, yeah? Extrinsic incentives and intrinsic ones. Um, this is something that we do with people in organization departments or traditional HR departments. We say, look, it's, yeah, it is about the money, but it's not always about the money. You know, it's about other kind of rewards that you can get. <coughs> working with people we like working with. So explore those aspects. Build bridges and include. Always be building bridges. In, in very large organizations, one of my favorite things is connecting teams and people, right? Because they're so large that you might have two individuals or teams working on a shared purpose, but they never connect. But as an external disruptive agent, you know, one of the best things you can do is just get around. You know, and I literally mean get around. Get to know people, random people in cafes and canteens. Find out what they're doing. Because you'll find a lot of these people have a shared purpose, right? Because they're all working for one organization. They're all working towards something. And then it's about connecting them and bringing those people together and leveraging the power of networks. A lot of individuals and teams forget the power of networking in large organizations. So what we try and do or what I try and do is go in and connect those networks because you know when, when you need help from ops, like back in the day when I used to work with my previous employer and I needed some help, uh, Occasionally, I have a great protocol and process. So I'd reach out to these individuals I'd met at the camps, or in the cafeteria, or in the canteen, individually. I would leverage my network. You know, examples are Hank and Paul over here, who I've reached out to to do stuff without following process to create value. Yeah? And because we're working for a shared purpose, it's possible. Because those people will reciprocate. They will see what you're trying to do. You're trying to create value as opposed to create you know, politics. And they'll go, yeah, we, we can work with that. Let's do that. Let's help this guy out because he's reaching out to build a bridge. So let's build a bridge. Stay focused. And be, and, and my second last point, right? Be agnostic to frameworks. Yeah, agile frameworks. Uh, the amount of zealous and like <coughs> religious right-wing agile marks I come across is just amazing. Yeah. And because I'm a pluralist, I just love talking to them. Why? Because they want to stick to their religion, I want to stick to all religions and take stuff out. Yeah. And until if you believe in an artist reach that is religion out there by some practitioners. So be agnostic. Be agnostic to Frameworks. Take stuff from frameworks that works best for you, your team, and the nature of the work that you're involved in. The nature of the work and people are the most important things. Right? So you can take things, practices, principles. Principles and values can be applied, period. Whether you're doing agile, whether you're scrumming, whether you're running Kanban, or whether you're working in a waterfall. It does not matter. You can bring those principles and you can bring those values and you can improve any team, regardless of the nature of their work. Yeah. But some of those practices become more important depending on their nature of the work. So I work with a lot of non-tech teams, yeah, and a lot of stuff and a lot of these frameworks is geared towards tech. So we take what is best, apply what adds value, and just park the rest to reflect upon at a later date whether or not we need it. Again, yeah. 
the axiom to each other. You know, if there's politics, make sure it's good politics, not bad politics. Last thing I want to show you guys is about the exit. What I mean by the exit is exactly that. Not all battles are worth their bounty. Yeah? And not every bounty is worth it. It's battle. So, no, when to leave. When you exit from a team because you've done your job, you know, they are self-organizing, they are in a good place and we can move on and work with another team. No when to exit from a department where, yeah, I've done my job with a number of teams here, it's time for me to move to another department and see them mature the same over there. And know when it's time to exit the organization for whatever reason. Again, links back to our values of being great. Now, we can't get comfortable as agents of change, disruptors, and our practitioners, we must never get comfortable. Because the moment we get comfortable means our job is either done or we're getting comfortable and not doing it properly. Right? And when that happens, it's time to go. And I love this goal. Now, I never lose. I either win or learn. And that's, again, an attitude you want and an attitude you want to see in your teams and individuals that you work with. It's not always about winning. It's about learning and along the way we may win. Which is cool. If we may not, that's cool as well. Because then we can revisit again and the next time we play it, maybe we win. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. We have now one product team that does a lot of products and we want in the future to split that up into multiple uh, teams. And one team is easy, manageable, you get the time, you connect them and everything. But do you have tips for me or for us how to improve when you have multiple teams? Because it's going to be a little bit harder to keep building bridges between teams that work separately from each other. So, they work separately, but they work towards the shared purpose. Uh, tips on working with multiple teams. How can you effectively work across multiple teams? Exactly, right? yes. So, firstly, there may be multiple separate teams, but they're all be working off a shared purpose, and that shared purpose would, should be reflected in a unified backlog. So, you all have sight on what features different teams are working towards. The other is, don't make them component teams, make them feature teams. So, they should cut across vertically from your feature set. So they are all working on a particular feature. The other is keep it simple. Yeah? There are many, many frameworks out there to scale Scrum teams and scale Agile teams. But I'm going to name one framework. I try to avoid naming framework. I'm going to name one. Yeah? Scrum at scale keeps it really simple. Yeah? It just literally scales the Scrum ceremonies at different layers and different levels. So from it, individual teams stand up to getting it in front of an executive team to unblock them. It happened within an hour and a half or two every day from a stand up perspective. So I'd, I'd suggest have a look at Scrum at scale. Uh, we look at uh, the same model and. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's 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 and fine as well. I'd say look at what fine model, but we. So I'd say, okay, this, this is going to be. I might get shot down for this, but don't look at the Spotify model. Man, you're not Spotify, are you? You're our PL. You've got your own culture, you've got your own thing going, you've got your own value you guys create. So right. You just don't take the, the nice things out of the framework. So yeah, that was what we're doing. But yeah, just, just look at all the frameworks, right? But look at how Spotify has structured it. But don't look at like how Spotify is implemented it inside their organization. Look at what you can take from it. Look at all the different models and see what you can take from it. And then experiment with things every two, four, six weeks. Yeah? From different models and see which one works for you. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Before you say that uh, go to the canteen, meet people, and your friend is met uh, from the ops, for example, and in that way you got stuff done quickly uh, there to buy you. But you think that having to go this way means that there is a problem in the way 
is working or the other guy is working because if you have to go behind, outside your comfort zone or outside the team to get stuff done, you have to do something. Those, those are very real situations, right? So Absolutely. not every team has the luxury or the privilege of someone from ops being dedicated to them or from the platform teams, right? And then processes sometimes get in the way. So you have to be a bit pirate. You know, you have to create good trouble, which is you're going to reach out to a person to get the job done as opposed to a process to get the job done because the person is going to respond faster. Uh, Sometimes it's going to go down well with the management. You know, I don't like the word management, but hey, it's going to go down well with the management because you created value, you unblock stuff, stuff. Sometimes it's not going to go down well with the management. But you know what? As long as you're creating value and getting the job done, and you're doing it for the right reasons, who gives a hell whether it goes down well with them or not? Any other questions? Okay, another one. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, regarding being transparent, so you say be transparent yourself so you will do other people around you. Uh, what if people above you, so the PO for example, Scrum Master, are not transparent for political reasons, of course, because they have the knowledge, they know something is going to happen, a big, uh, big merge, whatever it is, and they won't share it because they don't work with the state of mind, I mean, because there are other reasons. How can you make a difference if well, you don't get the knowledge anyway? you can spread your optimism your... So, the answer to that, short answer is yes, right? By being uh, as transparent ourselves, we hope that that is going to get contagious. The other thing is we coach our product owners. Now, you don't have to be a coach to coach. Yeah, you just have to be a team member who recognizes there's something not working. And I'm, I might be the only one or one of the few people who's figured out this is not working. So then it falls on to you to self-organize and coach other team members, including your Scrum Master, including your product owner, including leadership, right? That this is not working, this is, I think, what we should be doing. So call it as you do. Say to your product owner, dude, I know there's stuff on the release plan that you're not sharing. Yeah, can you just bring it out in the open? So we can talk about it and we can start thinking about how we're going to plan this going forward. Uh, encourage them. I will see this more as a one-to-one conversation than maybe as a meeting with the entire team. So, uh, the one-to-one -one conversations will build that relationship where they will earn, they will earn your trust and you will earn their trust. And when you've earned their trust, and that's when they will open up. And those one-to-one -one relationships have to be built. You know, sometimes it's easier to build it as a collective because we are all aligned on our principles and values, sometimes we're not. So when we're not, and we have someone who steps out of those principles and values, we need to bring them in. To do that, we build that bridge one-to-one -one that this is a safe environment. So when people are not transparent, it's because there's no psychological safety for them. So you've got to create that, and you don't have to be a coach or a scrum master or a product owner to do that. You just have to be a team member who's committed to our learning and my own self uh, continuous improvement. Cool. Any other questions? No? Awesome. Thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure.